Ephesians chapter 1. It's one of my favorite sections in the scripture, if I can find it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for everybody who's here today. I pray that each one of them would hear from you. Holy Spirit, as I'm speaking to quite a few people here today, praise God for a stormy morning. I pray that you would speak to individuals. As I'm speaking to many, you speak individually, we pray. Touch each heart, speak to each person. Grant that they would be open to you. I'm gonna interrupt that prayer. Do you want to hear God today? Would you welcome a voice from him just touching you, comforting you, saying, hey, I love you? Ask God right now to say, I'm open to whatever you want to say to me today, Lord. You don't have to say it out loud, but just, he can hear your thoughts. We're open to whatever you want to do in our hearts and lives today, Lord. Preacher included. Have your way. Minister to your people. Lord Jesus, you said you would build your church in the gates of hell. All the strategies of the devil would not prevail against it. Build your church today. Brick by brick, person by person. Anoint me to reach your heart and theirs and have your way in our service today, the remainder of it. We forbid any evil spirit to have anything to do with us whatsoever. In Jesus' name, be gone. You have no part in this matter. This is holy ground. This is God's house. We are God's house. Thank you for that, amen. We are the temple of God. Thank you, Lord. Have your way here today, in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, people worry about oh, what kind of a building are we gonna have? Is that a pretty, you know, a, a temple? And, and in Paul's day, in the first century, the Apostle Paul writing what we're gonna be reading today under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he said, you are the temple of God. God is not interested in buildings so much the church has gone to tremendous expense on the backs of the poor to build fancy cathedrals and, and I mean, look at this place, it's gorgeous. We bought it because it was convenient and it was a good deal. But we met in a bingo hall prior to this and we enjoyed it just fine. It's not about the building, it's about you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of God. The people, wherever we go and gather, the Lord is in our midst. The temple of God is there. We are the Holy of Holies. Glory. I like that. When Jesus was ascending to heaven, after dying on the cross, being resurrected on the third day, which we celebrate next Sunday, we try to get the calendar as close to Passover. The, the Pope Gregory, back in the 13th century, figured out a calendar that we still use to this day. And it's not always real accurate when it comes to biblical dates. But one, we, and we have no idea when Jesus was born. Best uh, estimates, uh, according to sheep being outside at that time of year and this, that, and the other thing, 
was uh, probably early October. But uh, we do know when he died. He died during the Passover. And uh, so the Easter, we don't no, say Easter. How many know we don't say Easter? Easter is the name of a false goddess of springtime and rebirths and all the springtime kind of things. And uh, we don't worship false goddesses under any name. Easter in, uh, in the Germanic tribes, which is English is a Germanic language anyway, is uh, the Germanic version of Astarte or Ashtoreth, the, the goddesses that tore allegiance away from the true God throughout the history of the Old Testament. The Jews being tempted by these seductive goddesses of fertility and rebirth. And, and oh, it sounds just like the resurrection. They, so somebody had the great idea, let's call it after her, the resurrection of Jesus, after a false goddess. That's not my sermon. I just get carried away sometimes. I'm getting old, you gotta you know, give me a little slack. And if you think that, you're in trouble. But anyway, <laughs> I'm teasing, having a little fun here. Because I like church. And I like being with you guys. When Jesus, prior, just prior to his ascension back to heaven, he had died, he had risen again, he walked among them for 40 days teaching and talking to the disciples, popping up here and there when they least suspected it. And uh, finally he was saying goodbye. And the Bible says there, there was 500 people that were present, but he was just with the 12 and he says, listen, I want you to go out into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature every human creature. And, but don't go out without the Holy Spirit. Stay here in Jerusalem. You have a whole world to reach, but don't go out by yourselves. Stay here in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. And he will then prepare you give you the armament in the realm of the spirit to do the job I've commanded you to do. And then he ascended into heaven. His last words were in Acts chapter one, verse eight. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And he ascended into heaven. They didn't leave Jerusalem. They stayed in Jerusalem. In fact, they had taken an upper room. Some scholars have put together, it might have been the, the home of uh, the mother of Mark, Anyway, I won't go into that, but it's a really good, good uh, supposition. And, but it had a large upper room, and that's where they gathered to pray. And there was 120 people up there 10 days later still waiting for the Holy Spirit. They didn't know what they were waiting for. But then as we read, read in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came upon them. The building was shaking. They saw little tongues of fire above each other's heads and they all began to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Languages that they'd never known. And some of them were known languages as they ran out into the street. They got so excited, they ran down the stairs and ran out into the street. It was a festival, Pentecost. 
And so the street was crowded with Jews from all over the Roman Empire and from different countries and that spoke different languages as their mother tongue. And the men that were in the upper room and the women came running down speaking in tongues and they were, whoa, you're just, you're, you're speaking in my language. Telling about the mighty works of God. And that's when the Holy Spirit came. And the gift of tongues is still around today. And when people receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, like the apostles did, uh, they generally speak in tongues. I don't know why. God makes the rules, amen? We have suffered so much criticism and ridicule and misunderstanding about tongues that I don't even want to talk about it today because that's not my subject. My subject is the Holy Spirit. Wait. That other verse was perfect. <laughs> but you shall be endued with power from on high when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. There's all sorts of people who don't wait for the Holy Spirit, especially the way the Bible defines it. The, the people say, well, I already have the Holy Spirit. I'm born again, hence I have the Holy Spirit. Well, the Bible says you be born of the Spirit. You're born again. And so, if you're a true believer, I'd have to say yes. But that's, the, all the disciples were true believers too. They were born again too. They were disciples of Jesus Christ. But still he said, wait until the power comes. Not just feeling good about your new life, but the ability to heal the sick, to do miracles, to cast out demons, to speak with tongues, if you will. And they waited, and that's what happened. The Holy Spirit came upon them in Acts chapter 2. They were all together in one place, and the Holy Spirit came upon them with a mighty rushing wind and they all began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And from then on, they went out to heal the sick, raise the dead, uh, to, according to the Roman authorities, to turn the world upside down. Simple fishermen and farmers from Israel turned the world upside down without fancy educations or degrees or a reverend in front of their name. I have a reverend in front of my name. That just means that you've been ordained to the ministry. Anybody who has been ordained, recognized as a minister of Christ, is technically a reverend. I never use it because it sounds kind of, you know, like I want to be just or something. I'm one of the guys, as it were, I just got stuck with being a leader when we first started. I haven't been able to get out of it. I'm not any more reverend than anybody else. Some people don't want the Holy Spirit. He, Jesus said, don't go out without him. Wait in Jerusalem. Don't, don't even try to do what I'm telling you to do without the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I've got the Holy Spirit. I'm born again. No, no, he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about a mighty baptism of fire and power. John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. These people that are, well, I'm born again. They don't have the fire. They see the fire and they're scared. They say, I don't know, that could be the devil. Well, that's funny because Jesus said that's what we're supposed to have. Some people are just plain afraid of the supernatural. As long as it's 
where I can understand it and add up the logical reasons for this and that. That's what, but you start getting supernatural, like, I, I don't want to go there. Supernatural is not just spooks and stuff. Supernatural is God. <laughs> Amen. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit and have supernatural power, you can get rid of the spooks and do powerful things for the kingdom of God. And that's what it's all about. I sent you to Ephesians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul is rejoicing in the Holy Spirit here in, in Ephesians, the first chapter especially. Verse 12, he said, talks about being in Christ to the praise of his glory. Verse 13, chapter 1, verse 13. In him, Jesus, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. I know some of these sentences really translate hard. I used to use the King James faithfully. It's the Bible that a pagan king of England authorized in 1610. Anyway, people get really religious about their King James, and I was one of them. And then I'm trying to read out of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 one time, and for with hitherto, and, and I, I was... I didn't know what I was reading, much less be able to tell the people I was talking to. And I said, forget it. I didn't want to be a total heretic, so I went to the new King James. <laughs> I'm joking, but I did, that's exactly what I did do. And even the new King James, like the scripture we read, is a little hard to follow. But what he's saying is, Jesus died for you and he gave you the Holy Spirit. This is for those who have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit that the apostles waited for and got. And you were sealed. That was a sign of your salvation and your standing in the kingdom of heaven. The, the power of the Holy Spirit within you. He said, it's an earnest payment. If you're gonna buy a house or something, make a major purchase, and you say, well, I'm gonna give you a down payment of this much, and then I'm gonna pay monthly this much for 15 or 20 years, whatever it is, your mortgage. But even before you pay the down payment, when you make, submit the bid, you submit an earnest payment. How many know what I'm talking about? You went, you bought a house the first, even before they've received your offer or anything, you, you submit $1,000 as an earnest payment. Non-refundable. But it's just to show I'm in earnest. I'm seriously making an offer. I'm not gonna change my mind. I'm putting my money where my mouth is right now. I do want that house. Jesus wanted us to be full-fledged members of his kingdom. And so when we received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and some of us today haven't received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and today would be a great day to do it, but when we received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that was an earnest payment on salvation. That's God saying, I'm for real here. The Holy Spirit is a sign of my good intentions to do what I've committed to do, which is bring you to heaven and glory for eternity. And you speak in tongues as the initial sign of receiving the Holy Spirit, and that's the earnest, say, ah, that's, that's $1,000 right there, the earnest payment. 
Then afterwards, you may get gifts of healings and miracles and casting out demons. This young lady with the gray hair that was leading worship and getting sentimental about her dad, and, and dad got saved, by the way, on his deathbed like three weeks before he died. He gave his heart completely to Jesus. I've told the story before, I won't say it again. But anyway, he totally converted. How do I get baptized when I'm bedridden? We'll figure it out, Grandpa. You know. Anyway, that precious lady is feared by the kingdom of darkness because she has a gift of discerning of spirits and the power to cast them out greater than anybody I've ever met. And I've been around half a hundred years and I've seen a lot of people, but I have never seen anyone as anointed as Rebecca is for discerning and casting out demons. I sometimes start the negotiations, but she usually finishes them. And I cast out demons too. We all have the power to do that if you choose to. Not imaginary, I bind you devil, go away. I mean, you got somebody going, no, Arr! and you say, get out of him in Jesus' name. I'm talking about the real thing. I'm not talking about different kind of substitutional stuff here. It's, it's also legitimate to command the devil to leave you in a certain situation, things like that. But uh, casting out demons is more than that. But anyway, because of the Holy Spirit, She's not holier than the rest of us. That's her gift. And at once upon, once upon a time, she received an earnest payment when she was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she began to pray in tongues and to prophesy. She prophesied over me. And that was the word that boosted me into receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit myself. She got saved before I did. She got filled with the Holy Spirit before I did. It's not fair. But it's a common story. A lot of times the ladies are a little bit quicker on the uptake than the men. The men are still figuring this out. And the women just, I love Jesus, man. I love it. Paul is rejoicing in the Holy Spirit. Why are some people against the Holy Spirit. If you tell them, they'll say, what kind of church do you go to? Well, a uh, Bible-believing church. Yeah, but uh, are you evangelical or charismatic or Pentecostal? Or Well, we're, I guess we're charismatic. And that means that we believe in speaking in tongues, casting out demons, healing the sick. And a lot of people right away, they just go, whoa. <laughs> no, I want something safe. The kingdom of God isn't safe. This world isn't safe. It's under the power of the wicked one, the Bible says. And if you've got the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you've got enough equipment to fight successfully against him. If you don't, if you choose to be an evangelical without the power of the Holy Spirit, if you really have a lot of willpower and and just a great character and strength of personality and everything, you will still make it to heaven. But you won't have half as much fun as we're having. And when you get resurrected or see Jesus, you'll be like, wow, why didn't you slap me or something? I could have had this from day one. But People are afraid of the supernatural, even the good supernatural. God is supernatural, remember that. They want an earthly religion. Under control, church starts on time and ends on time. I can put my casserole in the oven and it won't burn because pastor always stops at 11 o'clock sharp. Good luck.
I want what God wants. I want to give God the liberty to do what he wants to do. If he wants to start healing the sick in the middle of my sermon, and we've done that before, then he can do whatever he wants because I want him to be in charge. And that's what the baptism in the Holy Spirit is about. And that's what Paul is getting excited about here in the book of Ephesians chapter one. From about 15 to the end of the chapter, he begins to pray for the Ephesians. And it's a prayer for them to have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, verse 15, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I'll tell you what, when Paul prayed for you, it worked. He didn't just say, God bless Sister Susie. He was in the spirit. He says, I mention, make mention of you in my prayers, and this is what he prays for them that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. I'm gonna stop there because I wanna go back to the beginning. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ will give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Some people, as I've said, are born again. They're born of the Spirit. Some people are baptized in the Spirit and speak in tongues and, and exercise some of the gifts of the Spirit. But Paul wants to even go deeper than that. He said, I want you to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. There is more than speaking with tongues and praying for the sick and seeing them healed and casting out demons. We take, the, the New Testament church took this for granted because that's all they heard. Nobody had come up with evangelicalism yet. They said, well, this is what Christianity is. You, you get born again, then you get filled with the Spirit and you do miracles. Today we have to argue about it because the church fell away from the truth of God for so many hundreds of years that, that we're rediscovering it still. Thank God for the word of God. It gives us our guidebook. What about the spirit of wisdom and revelation? Deeper revelation, deeper wisdom. I was gonna preach on wisdom because wisdom in the Bible is more than just somebody being old and having seen a lot of things and, you know, things, you know, wise because they've experienced a lot of life. Wisdom is uh, an entity in the Bible, in, in Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom is a woman. And she's... She's identified in, in some of the phrases there the same way Solomon identifies his lover in the Song of Songs. My, my woman, my wife, my, my beloved. And wisdom is, is just this. The reason why I didn't pray on, preach on it is because I had to study it some more. It's, it's so something, and, the, and it's referenced. You know, if any one of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally to all. And 
We think of wisdom just in the natural, but wisdom is a, is a spiritual gift. Read Proverbs chapter eight and just see, wow. There's a, and that, I'm gonna preach on that someday, shortly, but, but I gotta learn more about it. Wisdom. We need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to operate correctly. When Becky was first saved, she had it in her heart that she wanted wisdom. And we were in kind of a tumultuous generation where all the values of the past were being questioned and we were jumping into all sorts of new things. People were even jumping out of windows because they were on LSD and they thought they could fly. And we were, it was a crazy time. And Becky recognized the need for wisdom. And she went to an evangelist meeting and he called her out to, and prayed for her for wisdom. And she's a wise lady to this day. God gave her his wisdom. Wisdom is more than knowledge. Wisdom is more than experience. It's, it's God's insight into things. And Paul is praying for the Ephesians. You, you guys are really good. You, you've got a growing church. They, they grew so big that they, had, they started a riot. Just not the Christians didn't, but the people were so threatened by how fast the church was growing that they tried to stop it in Ephesus. And they had gifts galore, but he said, I want you to have wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. It's one thing to know Christ. We know him as our savior. We, we know him through reading the Bible and find out what is his will under any given circumstances. There's something in the scripture to guide you in your decision making. And if it isn't something that's spelled out completely, the Holy Spirit is with you and in you and giving you the gifts and insight of the Holy Spirit, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you're just born again and you, for whatever reason, are hesitant about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're just trying to be a good person. And God will give you more power than the average person does trying to be a good person. But God wants us to be more than good persons. God wants us to be kingdom citizens, shaking, changing this world. So Paul prays, I want you to receive wisdom and revelation more than head knowledge, things that nobody else could teach you, revelation. That's something revealed by God. I can't give you revelation. I can give you my revelations, the things that God has revealed to me, I can try to explain them to you. You need your own wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You know Christ. You've been born again. Most of you have been filled with the Spirit. You know Christ. You feel like he's your friend, and he is. But there's more. There's a deeper walk, and that's what Paul's telling the Corinthians. I'm praying that you get wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That you start standing up and realizing the power that you have to change the world, to change your workplace. Well, they don't let us talk about Jesus. That's so pathetic. You live about Jesus. You're so bright and shining that they say, what is it about you? 
I noticed that you used to have a Bible on your bench there before they outlawed that at work. Isn't it crazy how the workplace, how our culture is so afraid of God that they don't let you talk about him? This is the United States, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever happened to freedom of speech? It seems to me that's right up there. And they won't let you talk about the Lord at work. They won't even let you have a Bible on your desk or bench or wherever you work. How crazy is that? I got saved at work. Led to the Lord by somebody at work. What if they wouldn't let him talk? He would have talked anyway. Because sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. When you're filled with the Spirit, you don't have to obey petty little rules of man. I don't mean serious. You know, you can't just go around breaking rules. On the other hand, God commanded you to tell people the gospel. Nobody can countermand that. We got to quit being intimidated by this world. I don't know. I can't do that. What? You need wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, not just to know a few things. You need to be a powerhouse. That's what God has for you. That's what the baptism in the Holy Spirit is all about. And the Ephesians have been around a little while. They're filled with the Spirit, but they're not causing riots anymore. And Paul says you need some you need a new oomph in your life. You need not just the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you need wisdom and revelation. You need wisdom to know how to, the wisdom of God to see through what's really going on and address the issue where it needs to be addressed. Instead of just saying, well, why can't I have my Bible? You, 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 we gotta get out of that mindset where we're letting people boss us around about the kingdom of God. You can't tell me what to think. Our nation is becoming more and more like a communist nation. Every, especially the last three, four years, it just taking away our liberties, erasing our borders. We are a land of immigrants, but we got here legally. We can't let this government turn us into a bunch of little fraidy cats. We need wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. Revelation, things that man can't show you, things that Pastor Kim can't teach you, things that well up within your spirit and you just know that you have to do this. Not new insights. Oh, yes, I have a new interpretation on Revelation chapter 10. Well, boogie woogie. People waste so much time picking away at Revelation and trying to predict the end times. I'll tell you what about that. Sideline. Footnote. People have never got it right. All the scholars of Israel never knew what Christ was really going to come like. It was there. Isaiah 53 and, and elsewhere, it was there. But they had a whole nother, they, all their interpretations were way off base. They knew where Jesus would be born and everything. Yeah, oh yeah, he'll be born in Bethlehem. And, and, but they, they had no idea what was really going to happen. A suffering servant come as the son of man. It was there the whole time. In fact, you look at it, the prophet, there's hundreds of prophecies about Jesus doing just what he did, but they didn't see it. And, the, and why I'm saying that is that all of our ideas about the end times are the same. Once it happens, we're going to say, oh, and it's not going to be anything we think. We do know Christ is coming back. That's what I'm banking on. In the meantime, I'm going to live as though he isn't coming for 100 years and expect him next week. Does that make sense? Anyway, 
But we got work to do. We need to be filled with the Spirit. We need to be filled with wisdom. If we have God's wisdom, we know how to get in and say things. And, and the boss didn't even realize that you were leading somebody to the Lord there because you have wisdom. That might not be the best illustration. But what I'm saying is, we are too worried about the petty little things of man and what is expected of us. And we have almost eliminated wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Christ. Because number one, we're trying to figure it all out. And number two, we're being intimidated by the world. Spirit-filled people can't be intimidated. I pray for you that you would have wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that your eyes would be enlightened. The eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that you may know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, his inheritance in the saints. We have not even scratched the surface of what is possible for us in the kingdom of God here and now. What are we worried about revelation for? Christ isn't coming when most of the world is still unreached. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in every nation to every people, and then shall the end come. We are still billions short of that even to reach peoples, much less individuals. I don't know how much joy there can be if you got resurrected and Christ came and well, hundreds of millions of people never even had a chance to hear about it because we were trying to figure out a timetable for the, end, the book of Revelation instead of doing what God told us to do, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him is, to know really what's happening and what needs to happen and what is the hope of our glory and the power of the spirit and everything that we can be doing about it instead of being like the seed that fell on thorny ground, not on the weed, weeds choking it up. We're living in this world and this world is clamoring for our attention and getting it most of the time. I pray that God would give you and I the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Christ. And everybody said, yeah. you can stand if you like. If you want to stay seated, that's all right too. I sometimes think that the Lord throws us curveballs just to see what we'll do. I'm always belly aching to the worship team about we don't have a bass player. Oh, well, how can we have a worship team without a bass player? Murmur, murmur. And uh, today the heartbeat was missing. No, we don't even have a heartbeat. Murmur, murmur. But God blessed. Amen. You worshiped the Lord and had a good time. He wants to stretch us. He wants us to become God sufficient. And not to have to have all of our ducks in a row before we do this or that. He wants us to be able to just step off the edge of a cliff 
at the word of the Lord and having received a revelation of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ and do what we're supposed to be doing regardless of all the reasons why we can't do it.